Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra. So you know, in the last video we have discussed the definition of a subspace and in this video, in part 7, we will look at examples. Therefore, now here you will see explicit calculations. However, before we start, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And with this, let's immediately go to the first example. And first I would say, let's look at a subset in R3. This means that each vector has three components, x1, x2, x3. And now I tell you what conditions the three components have to satisfy. First, I want that x1 is the same as x2. And in addition, x3 should be equal to minus x2. And with this, we have the whole definition of the set. Okay, now the question we want to answer is this set u a subspace in R3. In fact, if you're already familiar with linear algebra, you might answer this question immediately. However, you still need to write down a proof for it. Now, we will do this here by checking the three steps from the last video. And there you should recall, the first step is checking if the zero vector is actually in U. Therefore, let's take the zero vector and let's check if all the equations on the right hand side are fulfilled for it. So here we need that x1 and x2 are both zero. So here we need that x1, x2 and x3 are all zero. And then, obviously, we can immediately conclude that x1 is equal to x2. In other words, the first equation here is satisfied. Now, in order to check the second equation, we immediately see that minus 2x2 is also zero. And therefore, it's simply equal to x3. So the second equation is also fulfilled, therefore the zero vector is in U. So this is the important conclusion here, the first condition is checked. And of course, this is always the simplest one to check, and that's the reason we start with it. Now, the second one is about the scalar multiplication. In a rough way, we can formulate the second question as, is U closed under scalar multiplication? So it shouldn't be possible to leave the set u just by scaling vectors. Therefore, the starting point here is a vector in u and a scalar lambda. Here, please recall, if we want to show this property, we have to go with an arbitrary vector u in u and an arbitrary scalar lambda. And of course, our vector u should have three components we can call u1, u2, u3. And then we can immediately conclude that the two equations from above are satisfied for these components here. In other words, u1 is equal to u2 and u3 is equal to minus u2. So this has to be satisfied by the assumption that u is in the set u. And now the question is, what can we say about the scaled vector lambda times u? And maybe we simply call this one x. Hence, we know for the three components x1, x2, x3, we know they are equal to lambda u1, lambda u2, lambda u3, respectively. And now the overall question is, are the two equations here also satisfied for this new vector x? So this simply means x1 is equal to x2 and x3 is equal to minus 2x2. And now, of course, we already know this is equivalent to a formulation with the components of u and lambda. More precisely, this means lambda u1 is equal to lambda u2 and lambda u3 is equal to minus 2 times lambda u2. So we can simply use the fact that the components of x are given in this form. Therefore, to answer this question here, in order to show that we cannot leave u just by scalar multiplication, we have to go from these equations here to these ones. Therefore, this is now something we should try to do. More precisely, now we have this as our assumption, which means these two equations are our starting point. And now you see, in order to get here, we need a lambda 
Therefore, let's multiply both equations on both sides with lambda. So you see, this is not a complicated move. This is what we get. And then you see, we only need one exchange of two numbers to get what we want. Hence, the conclusion is, the vector x, that is lambda times u, is an element of the set u as well. So in summary, we can also check the second part here. And then, only the last and third question remains, is u also closed under the vector addition? Of course, this should work very similarly to the proof before. However, now the assumption will be different, because our input now consists of two vectors from the set u. So let's call them u and v, with components as before, so u1, u2, u3, and v1, v2, v3. And now you already know, because the two vectors lie in the set u, we have the two equations for the components. However, now we have the equations for u and for v. Moreover, now we have to ask, are the two equations also fulfilled for a new vector, which is now given by the sum of u and v. And of course, for this new vector x, we immediately know how the components x1, x2 and x3 are formed with the components of u and v. Namely, we simply have ui plus vi. Okay, now as before, of course, the new question is, is this equality and this equality fulfilled for our new vector x? And we can answer this question when we reformulate the two equations with the components u1 and v1. In other words, this is now what we want to show and we can only use these four equations here. Therefore, let's try writing down the proof for this. Okay, so here we have our starting point, the four equations we can use to show this. And maybe let's start with u1 and v1 here on the left hand side. Now we know from the first equation here that u1 is equal to u2. And from this equation we know that v1 is equal to v2. Hence we can put this in and we get u2 plus v2. So you see, this is immediately the first equation we wanted to show. Therefore, let's try doing a similar thing for the second equation here. So let's first substitute u3 with minus 2u2 and v3 with minus 2v2. Hence, you should see, the only thing we have to do now is to factor out minus 2. Which results in the second equation here, and you see, this is exactly what we wanted to show. So we can conclude that the vector u plus v lies also in the set capital U. Hence, we can also check the third property for a subspace. Or, to say it in other words, our set u that we defined above is indeed a subspace in R3. Okay, so you see, this was a nice positive example for a subspace. Therefore, in the next part of this video, I want to show you a counterexample. So here we have a subset u in R2, which consists of all vectors x1, x2, where the first component x1 squared is equal to the second component x2. Now, maybe with your trained eyes, you immediately see that because of the square, this cannot be a linear subspace. However, this is then what you have to show. For example, here we can show that the property B with the scalar multiplication does not hold for this subset. And indeed, to show this, one counterexample is enough. For example, what will work here is the vector u given as 1, 1, together with the scalar lambda is equal to 2. Now, what you first should see is 1, 1 is indeed an element in u, because 1 squared is equal to 1. Now, in the next step, as before, we can ask what is about the new vector x given as lambda times u. And of course, we know this vector here is 2, 2. And now we have to check, do we have x1 squared is equal to x2? So first we see the right hand side is equal to 2, but then we recognize that the left hand side is not equal to 2. Namely, this is 2 to the power 2, so 4. 
And that's important because it means we don't have the equality here. Hence, this means that we can leave this set u just by scaling. So we started with the vector in u, then we scaled it and now we lie outside of u. And this fact tells us we don't have a subspace here. And there you see, this is how you show that something is not a subspace. You find a suitable counterexample. Okay, then I think these are enough calculations for today. In the next part, we will continue with the theory. And in this sense, I really hope that I see you there. Have a nice day and bye.